One of the more problematic factors of modern gaming is that every game is treated like a cow. Companies just keep on milking until there's nothing but a dry husk left, and then they keep back some of the product to sell later at a higher price. I can, I can relate video games back to dairy farming. Downloadable content as a concept is a beautiful thing. Any method of continually showing support for a game and the people who play it, in theory, can only be a good thing for everyone involved. And I think it is sad that we focus a lot on when DLC is handled badly. Granted, when poor handling of DLC starts to become the norm and a characteristic of shithead publishers tainting gaming in the 21st century, it's something that shouldn't be ignored and I fully support people calling out bad business practices, but occasionally, credit where credit's due. Though it isn't that hard to make a good bit of DLC. As long as you go about the business of creating a game as normal and then think about DLC later, or alternatively, deliberately set aside content that will feel out of place within the main game, you know, it's not that difficult. As long as the game on release day doesn't feel like great big chunks have been lopped off and set aside later, you've probably done it right. Why exactly you'd mutilate your own creation is hard to understand. Games made by the people over at Bethesda are filled with so much content and so many things to do that you wonder why you need DLC at all. Usually they're released to let you do something that the main game won't let you do. I remember the houses from Skyrim's Hearthfire. But when you've got a good formula, you might as well take advantage of what you have and make some DLC that does the same. And, you know, Fallout 3 is quite good, I'm sure you could do something good with that. Despite the excellence of a game like Fallout 3, quite a lot of the DLC released for it was of variable quality. Overly simple, plagued by technical difficulties, not really up to scratch. But with Point Lookout, you could tell that this was Bethesda firing on all cylinders. I'm a big fan of when developers treat DLC like they treat the main game, more so if the base game is a good one. Fallout 3 is more than a good game, so the DLC really should be something special. Point Lookout stands out for a number of reasons, particularly the official description which says it's the most open-ended Fallout DLC adventure yet. And, you know, they're not wrong, but I'm surprised more of the DLC wasn't like this. Point Lookout comes of a huge map, nothing close to Capital Wasteland, but pretty massive for what amounts to a small slice of a game. What you're actually doing here is more centred around the surreal and slightly trippy. It's not quite Dunwich, but it is exactly what it tries to be. Not just this isolated area that time forgot that you can freely explore and fill in some gaps, but it also acts as a brilliant chunk of Fallout 3 proper. It's not too different to the kind of game Fallout 3 is, but it's as good as anything the game can offer you. Just a little weirder. I don't like zombies. Not out of fear, they're way too slow for that, and in the event of a zombie apocalypse, you just make camp in a building with doors that you have to pull open. Now, I dislike zombies because they're everywhere nowadays. Where this fixation blossomed from, I don't know, but you can barely take two steps without stumbling across some form of zombie pop culture. Whatever the fuck that means. So by all accounts, I should hate something like Red Dead Redemption's Undead Nightmare, but somehow retreading a path like this isn't actually as painful as you'd think. For a start, Red Dead Redemption as a standalone game is as full of content as you could ever want. Doesn't really matter what you spend your time with, it's gonna take a while to get everything done. Secondly, something as absurdly contrasting as a zombie apocalypse fits very snugly into the type of content that should be set aside due to it not really fitting the tone of the main game. And even when you do cough up the cash to take on some Wild West zombies, you're taken along for this cheesy six hour campaign where you try and stop the outbreak of a deadly virus, and at no point do the incredibly high standards set by the main game even think about dropping. If Rockstar didn't want to make this DLC, they could have easily expanded it a bit and released it as a spin-off game. To have it as a cheap side campaign in one of the best games released in the last decade, that's mightily impressive. Let's hope they treat the sequel with as much intelligence. I kind of don't like how Undead Nightmare is all about zombies, because I fear that zombies are the go-to place for video games nowadays, but the level of quality in this optional content is pretty incredible. A lot of effort went into Red Dead Redemption, and you can tell that Undead Nightmare was treated with equal importance, and I can only respect that.
A few years down the road, we'll come to understand just how crazy a game Super Smash Bros. 4 really was. I don't think it had the same kind of hype behind it as Brawl, but with potentially less pressure on the game, it delivered in spades and is clearly a franchise on the move. What made Smash 4 even more exciting from a speculation point of view was that even when the game came out and the character roster was finalised, we still had the small matter of downloadable contents to lose our minds over. And good lord we lost our minds. If you said at the start of this journey that Smash 4 would end up with Ryu from Street Fighter, Bayonetta from... Bayonetta, fucking Cloud from Final Fantasy VII, you'd be laughed off the stage. This is the kind of character roster that people fantasised about back in the days of Brawl. One that covers so many bases and garners attention from fans of many different franchises. It hits this strange medium where Smash 4 is a totally complete game on its own, but you are still missing out if you don't pick up these characters. I thought voting was a nice touch too. Not sure how he ended up with Bayonetta winning that, but apparently Europe had quite a big say in that. Do we have that power? Kinda like that. Can we use it to get Snake back in there? Fucking Konami, listen up, it's gonna it's never happen, this is so sad. Nintendo are really behind the times. Between their questionably powerful hardware and their pretty belligerent stance on copyright, it's like they're operating a good five years behind everyone else. But this does mean that Nintendo haven't quite figured out that they can be quite a big dick when it comes to DLC. Oh, silly naive Nintendo, don't you get it? You're not supposed to respect the consumer and give out downloadable content without total disregard for your reputation and the likelihood that someone will never ever trust you again. Somewhere along the lines, I think some wires got crossed and so Nintendo, for a while at least, are actually pretty kind when it comes to additional content. Smash Bros was one thing, Hyrule Warriors is a more extraordinary thing. Not sure how Dynasty Warriors games handle DLC, but I imagine it can't be too different to the generous bounty that Hyrule Warriors offers. It depends how much credit you want to give Nintendo. And you should give quite a lot, because this game gets pretty much everything right when it comes to DLC. There's a great mix of large, free add-ons and patches. You thought you'd max your character's level out? Let's just raise that cap a little. And also pay DLC that is pretty hefty for the amount of cash you actually throw at it. I've never really cared too much for the difference between paid or free DLC, but Hyrule Warriors strikes this hugely admirable combination of the two, where both enhance the game without feeling like they should have been there at the start. And bear in mind that the base game of Hyrule Warriors already has buckets for you to do as is. This is like making a giant cake and then dumping an avalanche of cherries on it later. Enjoy it while it lasts. I expect the inevitable turnaround when Nintendo realises how much they can exploit DLC to happen one day. Making good DLC hinges on respecting the customer, making sure that you see the people who might want to buy these add-ons as gamers and not as walking sacks of money. Having a bit of perspective certainly helps, and if you can sympathise with the needs of the man on the street, you're halfway there. Maybe that's the problem, huge names seeing just how much they can get away with, and that despite all the ridicule the optional content might get, you can just choose not to buy it. But we're here for positives, and one of the big benefits of being an indie game? You haven't forgotten your roots. Binding of Isaac is a huge game. Attempting to do all there is to do in the original game is ambitious. Attempting to do all there is to do in the remake is... <laughs> Good luck. Due to the roguelike and random nature of virtually everything in the game, you can pour hours into either game without too much trouble. But then the original game got an expansion called Wrath of the Lamb, which brought in new items, new floors, a whole bunch of new mechanics and some challenges. All of these got carried over to Rebirth, but on Halloween last year, Rebirth got even bigger. Attempting to do all there is to do in Binding of Isaac Afterbirth is... <laughs> oh my! The quantity of items added is slightly more like a drop in the ocean than before, but Afterbirth saw some serious changes made all the way through the game. There's the occasional big one, like a difficult additional floor and a whole new mode, but even the little things like the new room layouts and transformations have a huge effect on how the game plays. Rebirth isn't anywhere close to being an incomplete game, but when you go back to it from Afterbirth, you can feel and really miss the parts of the game that were added or changed. There's still a few things that need balancing since so much was changed, but when you're talking about giving credit, Afterbirth is in a class of its own. 
This we remembered Luigi, and there was a thread in the Binding of Isaac subreddit made by creator Edmund McMillan, with the intention being that user suggestions could be compiled and potentially implemented in the DLC. In the end, quite a lot of the items that ended up in the DLC did come from user ideas. There's also supposed to be like a mini DLC coming later this year, which is going to have new items and maybe a new character, but also, of key importance, official mod support. So, how exactly do you make good DLC? Give the people what they want. Got a topic that you'd like me to discuss in a countdown? Leave a suggestion in a comment below and head over to my Twitter where I'll be holding a vote to decide the subject of the next countdown based off the best of your submissions. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one. Hey everybody, hope you like that, it's really cold as I'm recording this now so I'm gonna get on with things otherwise my nipples will become diamonds and you wouldn't like that. I've actually started using my Patreon properly, so if you want to support the show, you can head over there and donate however much you like. I don't really mind, it's all very helpful. For one of the rewards, I'm actually doing a video series explaining exactly how I make these videos, so if you're interested in that, you can, you can find it there somewhere. Basically glazed eyes and furiously mashing a keyboard with a clenched fist. It's a very technical operation over here.